evening, everyone. Thank you, Professor Koltas, for the invite, and thank you all for coming today. I hope that at the end of this lecture that you will learn something about chemistry if you're not a chemist, and also that you will learn about ways to succeed in science. So today, as seen on the screen, the title of my talk will be Tales from a Chemist, Advancing Natural Product Chemistry, and the Synthesis of Molecules of Biological Interest. So I'm going to start at the beginning. So this is where I'm from. I'm from uh, Jamaica, which is in the Caribbean. And Jamaica is known for lots of different things. I'm sure there are many of you out here who are also from different countries. Um, so just to let you know that you can succeed if you work hard. It doesn't matter where you are in the world or what the classes are. You just need to work very hard to try and succeed. So um, we're known for our beaches, as well as um, our vegetation. We have lots of uh, native plants in the island. And we're also known for singers or dancers and for athletes as well. So I'm the first of two children. Um, my parents are um, both, well, both have been in the education, education system. And so from a very early age, they instilled in us that it's very important to put your best effort forward. Once you do that, you can succeed at whatever you're doing. So try very hard and put your best effort forward. So there's a picture of my brother, um, younger brother, a long time ago. And this was me at my high school graduation. So during high school, we were exposed to the sciences. So we're exposed to biology, chemistry, and physics, as well as many other courses. And what I found was that I liked chemistry the most. The part of physics that I liked was nuclear physics, which had to do mainly with chemistry and the atom. So I decided to pursue chemistry because that was the one that was my favorite um, course. Um, does anybody here like solving puzzles? Anybody else? Right, so chemistry is kind of like a puzzle. And that was one thing why I really um, liked it. So I ruled out being a doctor for one main reason. And that is one day I saw someone who had a cut and you know it was bleeding and I don't like the sight of blood. I started crying as well. And so I was like, yeah, I can't be looking after patients and crying, so maybe that's not the right path for me. But I still wanted to help in terms of you know, medicines and being in the pharmaceutical industry. So I decided that making the compounds behind the scenes would be the best thing for me. So after that, what I did when it got to, um, got close to the time to attend university, I looked at the catalog and in there I saw many different chemistry programs. And the one that really appealed to me was chemistry and management. Um, I had never been exposed to a lot of business courses, and so I wanted to learn more about that. Um, but I still wanted to major in chemistry. And so I decided to pursue a double major in chemistry and management. And they're totally unrelated. So it's joined there, that's the name of the degree, but it's totally unrelated. They're separate um, courses. So this was a very special program. Only six students were accepted to that program every year. And so you had to work very hard to get good grades so that you would be accepted into the program. So luckily for me, I got accepted into the program. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about me, I'll get into some of the chemistry. Um, now don't worry if you're not a chemist, I'll throw a little bit um, of non-chemistry slides in here and there, so just stay awake and keep with me. Okay, so I've done a couple of um, research projects in different labs. Um, I did one in Jamaica, in the lab of Professor Jacobs, where I looked at um, what the chemical components of two Caribbean plants are. And the name of the plants are Garcinia humilis and Clusia flavor. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. 
I also looked at synthesis, so making compounds in the lab. And for that project, I worked in the lab of Professor Kaczynski at the University of Florida. And the project was entitled Expanding Benzotriazole Methodology, looking at difficult peptides and other molecules of biological interest. And there are two other projects that I looked at um, at the University of Pennsylvania. I doubt that I'll have time to go through all of it, but if you're still interested after the talk, um, please feel free to come and talk to me. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the chemical components of plants. Now I was very interested in this project because you know, plants and different marine life are good for making drugs. And actually you get drugs from those plants and marine life. Um, has anybody ever um, had heard any wise tales? Like if you get like a hornet sting or something, they say grow three pieces of leaves on it or something like that. Well, that's because of the compounds in the plants. They can help to reduce the swelling. And there are many other wise tales and actually traditional or folk medicine um, that you can find about different things. So I wanted to find out what are the chemicals in these plants that could be potentially useful. And so I looked at the first plant, which is Garcinia cumulus. So just to give you a brief background, of all the drugs that came on the market between 1981 and 2008, 63% of them were from natural products or natural product derivatives. And so this is a very important area of research because 63% of drugs that are made have something that resemble these natural products that are from plants or um, marine life. And so the plant that I studied is in the Clusiaceae family and there are 50 different genera and around 1,600 species. And they're still discovering many more species today. Now, these are some popular ones um, around. There are Calophyllum, Hypericum, Clusia, Mamia, and Garcinia. Those are the popular um, members of this family. And the types of compounds that you can find from them don't be, you know, confused by all these structures. Um, are benzophenones, xanthones, coumarins, flavonoids, and triterpenes. And these are all very important compounds in plants and they can help us as well. For example, benzophenones have been known to um, have antioxidant activities as well as anti-cancer activities, and there is actually one called clusianone that they think may have anti-HIV properties. And so this is a very interesting um, family to study. So just a little bit about the plant that I studied. Um, it's also called wild mammy. So that's the common name, or hat stand tree. And it's usually around 2.5 meters high, and the fruit is edible. So just like many other plants that um, you know, we find around the place. And one important thing is that the bark can be used to treat parasitic skin disease. And so you'd see why I would be interested in looking at this plant. You know, what is the compound you know, that's responsible for this action in this plant? And so I took the plant, and the first thing that you do when you have the plant is you crush it into really small pieces because you're trying to get the compounds out of it. So you crush it, you pour some liquid on it, and all the compounds in there will seep out into the liquid. And then I take the liquid and reduce the amount of liquid by heating it up, basically. And then I put it on a column. Now column chromatography is one technique that's used to separate different components um, in a mixture. And so I put the, this mixture on the column 
and I will use that to separate the different components. So after I did that, being guided by another chromatography technique, which is called thin layer chromatography, I was able to isolate or get in the pure form many different compounds. One set of compounds is shown here, these two compounds. And they were yellow crystals, they had a melting point of 128, and the molecular weight, so this is how heavy it is, was 534 grams per mole, and this, what, this is the molecular formula. So this just shows how many different atoms it has. So how many carbons, that's, the, that's C, how many hydrogens, and how many oxygens. And another interesting thing about these compounds is that they are ketoenol tautomers. Um, some of you may have learned it in organic chemistry. Um, for the rest of you, it's very interesting. And we're not these. Okay, so actually, when you look at the total weight of the compound in comparison to the dried plant material, it's only 0.7%. So that's not a lot. So if you actually want to use these compounds that you isolate, then we have to find a way to make it. And that's why later on, I tried to learn how to make compounds in the lab. Some other compounds I isolated included this simple benzophenone. So there is a benzene ring here, another benzene ring on this side, and a carbonyl compound, or a carbonyl group here. And so this simple benzophenone has what is known as degrees of unsaturation, and there are nine degrees of unsaturation in this simple benzophenone. And I won't get into all the details about these other compounds, just to show you the range of compounds that were isolated. So I also isolated these compounds, which are known as xanthones, and they have a lot of oxygens in them, which I've shown in red. Again, steroids and triterpenes were some of the compounds isolated. So basically, if you work on a plant or you know a marine plant or an animal, a sponge, then you can find many compounds in this you know material or in the plant. It's the same with us. There are many different molecules in our bodies as well. So we're very complex. Okay, so the other plant I looked on. Um, was Clusia flavor. Again, this is found in Jamaica, and it has other names such as cardgum and tar pot. The trees grow up to around 10 meters tall, so that's very high, and the leaves are used to treat syphilis. So we would definitely be interested in knowing what compound in that is responsible for you know, this kind of action. And also, the stem, the gum that's in the stem, is used to heal wounds that you may get. So any little cuts that you can get, if you rub the gum on it, it can help to heal it quicker. And so this is a very important plant to study as well. So in this plant, I also found some benzophenones, which are known for this group of plants, and they're shown here. So basically, um, these plants are a very rich source of new and interesting compounds, and they have the potential to cure different ailments, and so they're a good source of new chemicals for testing in biology. Do you have any biology majors here? Okay, great. So when you do your assays, you get the compounds from us to do these assays. So that's how chemistry and biology will work together. Okay, so basically this work was done at the University of the West Indies, and there are three campuses located on three different islands. Um, one is Barbados, Jamaica of course, and then this little one here, Trinidad. And um, I completed my BSc degree at the University of the West Indies, and that was in chemistry and management, which is a double major. And I also did a Master of Philosophy degree, which is just a research uh, master's at the University of the West Indies. 
Okay, so now I was done with undergrad and also done with um, the master. So what was next? How do you decide what to do? So one thing for me, I was exposed to the business courses and I also liked it. I like everything that I do, so there, there's a problem when I have to make decisions on which direction to go in. Um, one thing that I did was I tried to do some other business courses to see if I would like this for long term. And also because I didn't want to leave Jamaica because somehow I got the feeling if I pursued chemistry, it would take me to other places. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go. And after doing that, um, I realized, you know, chemistry is what I really want to do. So I will encourage all of you, you know, do what you are passionate about because you'll be doing that for a long time, you know, so you don't want to do something that you don't like. And um, another thing that I did while I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do was I taught middle school, high school, and freshman biology, which is different from chemistry, for two years. Um, and I like teaching at that level as well, and so that even propelled me further to go and do more studies in chemistry so that I can learn more, so that I can impart more to everyone. So one person who inspired me, or many people inspired me actually along the way, and one of them was my mentor at the University of the West Indies. Um, she encouraged me to apply for universities outside of Jamaica because she said it will help you to think outside of the box. So, you know, go get new experiences, move out of your town, move out of your city. It, it will be challenging initially, but get new experiences. It will make you a better person for that. And so, based on her suggestions and also my parents and my family, I decided to apply to many schools. So, that's how I came from Jamaica all the way to Florida. Well, it's not as far across the Atlantic, but um, it's a little journey. So one thing that I needed to do in order to get into grad school was the GRE, which is the graduate record exam. And so you will find that as you go through you know, your studies, when you get to the end of your undergraduate studies, for those of you who are transferring, you will need to do entrance exams so that you can qualify to go to the institution of your choice. So for other areas, it may include the GMAT, if you're doing business-like courses, or PCAT if you want to do pharmacy studies, or LSAT if you want to do law. Um, but there are often requirements for you um, to meet to get into those institutions. So I encourage you, you know, look at the different institutions. If you have a dream institution that you want to go to, look at the requirements, look at what you need, and work towards that so you can get in. So I'll quickly talk about um, one other project that I did, which is synthesis. So using two molecules or more and joining them to make a new molecule. So this, uh, Great man uh, said, all is experiment and adventure. We are forever mixing ourselves with unknown quantities. What is to come, I know not. And that's the whole thing about research. You don't know what will happen, what you will get, but you have a question that you want to answer. So that's basically what research is. If you go and you wonder, why is it on every Thursday, this stoplight catches me at 10.43? That's potentially a research question. Like Any questions that you have, those can be research questions. So you don't have to be a Nobel Prize winner or somebody who won a lot of awards. If you have a curious mind and you have a really good question that you can ask that others want to know the answer for, then that's a good project for you to pursue. That's a good topic for you to pursue. So, I'm just going to get into the aims of this project, and that was to look at different reactions with benzotriazole and to try and make new compounds. So 
basically, you can find peptides and proteins in many different compounds. So for those of us who need to use skin regeneration, of course, none of you in this room, because you're all too young, you don't need to use that. So those of you who need to use like oil of LA or that kind of thing, um, that has an, an amino peptide complex. And also within our bodies, this hormone, oxytocin, is made up of um, peptides. Humalog, which is the drug used to treat diabetes, insulin, that's also made up of peptides. And um, you have many other examples, even these common foods that you find. So your Coke, um, your Pepsi, your yogurt, your sugar-free gum, they are all made up of peptides and amino acids. Animal feed as well. And so peptides and amino acids are everywhere. They actually make our bodies up as well. And so it's very, interesting to look at them and see what use we can have for them that have that has not been discovered as yet and also how we can make them so that we can get the benefit of these compounds so just to look at the history for a little bit peptide chemistry has been around for a very long time as you can see from 1882 there have been reports of peptides being made. And all the way in 1984, Merrifield got the Nobel Prize for his work in solid phase peptide synthesis. So peptide synthesis and the study of peptides has existed for over 100 years. So there are two ways that you can make peptides. You can do it in solution, so you know, have some liquid and then you throw the peptides in there and join them together, or the amino acids and join them together. Um, and this uh, is very useful if you're making large scale um, material and if you're making uncommon peptides and proteins. You also have solid phase, so in that you have a bead and you attach your peptide that's growing to the bead. So there are two ways to make it, either in solution or in the solid phase when you attach the peptide to a bead. So just to mention, I mentioned that our bodies are also made up of peptides and amino acids and proteins and in our bodies, enzymes are responsible for making the amide bond, which is found in peptides and proteins. In the lab, we have to figure out a way to make that. And that has been done by many different people, and these are some of the compounds that you can use to help you to make them. So peptides and amino acids and proteins contain functional groups. So here we have uh, carbonyl, we have our carboxylic acid if it's an amino acid, but in the peptide it has the carbonyl group and you also have your amine as well. So there are many uh, different groups that you can have in or peptides and amino acids. And so I made a whole lot of these compounds as you can see here and I was able to make them pretty efficiently. And so what I did after figuring out the way to make them was I tried to make something that's useful. So the first thing I did was to make this peptide here. And as you can see, this is uh, used to tell whether or not the peptide is pure. And that's high HPLC. And if you see one peak, which is your product, and you don't see a lot of other peaks around, then it means your compound is pretty pure. So that's a pretty good way that we came up with of making this peptide. And so this is what the peptide um, looks like. And these little numbers here are just numbers that we use to help us to know whether or not we made the right peptide. So one interesting peptide that I looked at was um, a part of the amyloid beta peptide. 
Has anybody heard of Alzheimer's disease? Okay, so amyloid beta, pept beta peptide is thought to be responsible for Alzheimer's disease. It's thought that these peptides group together and they form plaques, which is just a whole mass of peptides, as shown here. And so this disrupts different processes in healthy cells, and then the cells become unhealthy. And so one problem that people have had studying this disease is that they're not sure how the plaques form. And so if we can find a way of making this compound and then studying how it behaves, then who knows what can happen. We could possibly find a cure. And so we were interested in making this peptide segment. And so this is what the segment looks like. Um, it's a short peptide, but pretty difficult to make. And we were successful at making that. So basically, in this part, we developed a good way to make peptides. And this method was a new method that we came up with, and many other people were interested in it, some companies, and so we were able to form collaborations with some companies, as well as sell some of our compounds to some companies. Now, one thing that's very important is working together if you're in the sciences. Especially nowadays when everything is all mixed up. You know, you can't tell what is biology, what is chemistry, what is physics. You can't tell the difference. You can't tell what math is different from, you know, chemistry sometimes, or physical chemistry when you get to do it. Um, and so you need to develop those skills to work together in a team. So if you can't work well in a team as well, then practice with your siblings, get better, and hopefully uh, everything will work out well. Okay, so all of this work was done at the University of Florida, um, which is in Gainesville. And it's a really large school in comparison to the school that I went to before. So the University of the West Indies has around, well had at the time around 13,000 students, including both full-time and part-time students. And then I went to this school with 46,000 students. So when you transfer sometimes, you will go to a much larger campus than this campus here, but don't get lost in everything. You know, find a friend, find people to talk with, go to the career center, go to the counseling center, find somebody to help you through the process. So don't get lost if you end up going to a big institution. So just a few more things. Also, don't forget to have fun if you work hard, but you must work hard for you to qualify to have fun. So <laughs> I did actually end up going to, so this picture, I actually took that picture here. Well, actually all the pictures, I took them. Um, this was at a basketball game and at a football game here. And then this was a parade that they had at homecoming. So you can only have fun after you've done your work. And work smartly is not how much time you put, it's partly that, but it's how smart you work. So use your time wisely as well. Okay, so I kind of took a roundabout route to get to this uh, PhD. And um, some people go straight from undergraduate studies to grad school, um, but other people like me, I worked for a little bit and then I came back. I also did part-time work with study, which a lot of you um, probably have done or may do in the future. Um, it doesn't matter which path you take. There is no correct path, right? For each person, there is a path that will work for you. So you use your path, whatever path you have, and you work at it the best as you, at that you can. And if you continue to work hard, then you will get to the end, you will get to graduation. So here are a few pictures um, from graduation at UF. And just to mention a few more things, um, while there, I was given a lot of responsibility um, by my advisor. And so I was um, a project leader where I mentored some undergraduates um, that came not only from UF, but they were from other countries as well and other places in the US. And I'll tell you more about that program in a little bit. And I also got a couple of awards and helped out with 
teaching as well. And so there are many summer opportunities available for undergraduate students and for you guys here at DCCC. Now, I have some listed here, and if you are interested in them and you want them more, I can get a copy of the list to you. You can just stay after and give me your names or something or email and I'll send it to you. Okay, so you have um, the NIH Summer Internship Program in Biomedical Research. So if you're interested in you know, biology, a little bit of chemistry, even physics, any one of the sciences, then this might be a good program for you to look up. Um, there's also the NSF research experiences for undergraduates. And that is the program that a lot of the students that I worked with came on. So there were people from Brazil, people from Colorado, people from all over. Um, there is also Alliances for Graduate Education and the Professorate. Um, the Leadership Alliance, Amgen Scholars, Research at Big Ten Schools, and in this area, in the New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, there are also opportunities for you to do research. So if you feel that you're a bit interested in you know, STEM research, you know, whichever part of STANS, and you're not sure what it will be like if you really want to pursue it, then this might be a good avenue for you to pursue. You know, try it, see if you like it. Um, you may fall in love with it. You know, so I encourage you guys to really uh, pay attention to these and uh, look them up and see what you can do. So Rutgers University has a program as well, it's called RISE, and also um, uh, UM, this is a med school here, U, UMDNG, UMDNG, um, they also have a program, and um, this one is for New Jersey residents only, but there's a research program in neuroscience. So if you're interested in the brain and the way it works, um, you can pursue this one. And Princeton University also has a program. So I know some of you out there are thinking, oh, I can never get into these programs. No, everybody can get into the programs. You just need to apply. If you don't try, then you won't get in. So I want you guys to seriously look at the criteria, what you need to get in and to prepare your packets. So you can participate in this kind of research program if you show that you have a transfer agreement with a four-year school. So if you're going to transfer, then you can participate if you're doing your second year here. Um, the deadlines are in January and February usually, and so now is the time for you to start looking at them. And you can spend the Christmas period making sure that you get all your materials together and asking for recommendations from your professors who would be happy to write these letters for you. Um, so there are many careers in chemistry. Um, so you can be an industrial chemist and work in many different sectors. Um, there is agro sciences, there is polymer, there is food, there is cosmetic, paint, everything you can think of, there is chemistry that's attached to it. Um, you can be a professor. Um, there are many different um, institutions that you can work at. You can work at a community college, you can work at a liberal arts um, college, you can work at a research university. So that's a really big one. Um, you can be a high school chemistry teacher. And some of the more uncommon ones are, you can be a patent agent or a patent lawyer. So people who know the sciences are a real asset to the law profession because it's very hard for you to learn the sands after you've learned the law. If you know the sands, it will be a breeze for you. So that's also an avenue that you can pursue. You can be a technical or sans writer. So you can write patents um, or different documents for different people. You can be a policymaker and go to Capitol Hill. Um, you know, there are many things um, that need chemistry in terms of the environment, um, you can help to make policies that will keep the world safe and safe for many years to come. You can be um, the CEO of your own company if you want. There are funds available. If you have a great idea and you want to start a company, there are funds, you can do that. So you can be 
your own boss. You can help to clean up the environment, so there's hazardous waste management. Um, you can be a consultant, so you can use your skills and your expertise to help other people solve problems. Material science is another area that you can work in. Um, you can be a research chemist, so you can work in the biomedical field or any other aspect of chemistry. It can be um, at a university as well. You're not the professor, but you want to do research only. That's also available. And there are many resources on the web. Use the resources that you have. Um, the American Chemical Society is a very good resource um, for everybody at all levels. So you can probably um, just Google American Chemical Society and look up the different things that they have on the website that are available for you. So I won't get into this now. Um, we don't have enough time, and so I'll skip to the end. One thing that I definitely have to do is to thank everybody who helped me through this process. And those are all my mentors, um, Professor Kaczynski, um, Professor Helen Jacobs, Professor Kong and Mahaski, and everybody who works in the group. Of course, I have to thank Professor Patterson, who is the director of the program that I'm in now, and also the NIH for funding. And thank you guys so much for your attention. I know it was a bit long, but I hope you got something from it. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So we do have 10 minutes for questions. Please take advantage and ask Danabelle anything you'd like to. Anyone else need to sign in before we begin? So you were isolating the natural products from the plants. How did you know which compounds to look for? Okay, that's a very interesting question. So it's like a part of a puzzle. So we have a tool that's called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and it gives you a picture of what you have in a mixture or you know what the compound will look like. So when you get that picture from the instrument, then if it has a certain, um, if, it's, if the picture has a certain uh, look to it, then you know this compound is potentially important. If it has a particular fingerprint. And so that's one of the tools that I use, use to guide me in terms of which compounds or which mixtures to look, at, look on in the plant. So that's a tool called NMR, which gives you a picture of what the compound will look like. Come on guys, don't be shy. Do you have any opportunities in your native homeland for the research and what do you do? Um, so there are very few opportunities. Um, I think if uh, I wanted to contribute a lot more, then I would probably have to start something on my own, um, which you know is a good avenue for people to pursue these days. But um, we have lots of work that needs to be done. Um, we just need to organize ourselves to do it. When you were talking about isolating the um, peptides and the acids for Alzheimer's, that was the uh, information you gave to other companies, like drug companies that they're further researching, or are you further researching that? <coughs> Okay, so um, one thing that a lot of companies tend to be in, interested in and a lot of researchers is how to make things well. And so we came up with a new method for making this very difficult peptide. Okay. And so they wanted to get, some of them wanted just the compound, so they wanted us to make it, they would purchase it. Um, but some of them wanted to know how we did it. Um, and actually uh, one very important thing that I failed to mention in the talk is in SANS, Everybody tries to tell others um, what they've done. You know, communication is very important, both with the public and also with other scientists. Because you don't want to be repeating something that somebody has already done. And so people publish their work, you know, write it up in a journal, kind of like a newspaper, you compile all the stuff. And you can look in there to see how people have done stuff, what they've done. And so it's very important to share your knowledge in a sense. And so we've actually published some of this work as well. I saw another. Okay, so one, two. So 
so as she asked, like, are, is there still researches that are still belonging that about hearing from counselors? Oh, oh yeah, definitely. There is a lot of work being done on this, and actually from different perspectives too. Um, I didn't discuss the work that I was doing at the University of Pennsylvania, but in the lab that I was working in, um, they were trying to see how you could tell if somebody will be prone to getting Alzheimer's. So if you have you know, some unique qualities or something in your brain that will help um, them to know whether or not you will get it. And so what we made in those labs are some compounds that you can inject into the brain or any part of the body and it will light up if you go in an instrument and give you a picture, like an MRI. Has anybody ever done an MRI scan or heard of anybody? So, right, so it's just like that. And so they've actually been very successful at doing that. And uh, Eli Lilly, which is a chemical company, actually um, bought the company that my boss started, um, to, that he started to use to develop this drug. And you know, he made a lot of money for that. Um, so, yeah, there is still a lot of research being done from different angles, how to make the compounds, how to know whether or not you'll be um, getting Alzheimer's sometime in the future, um, and how to solve using different strategies. Yeah. Okay, so to isolate compounds or to get compounds pure from a mixture, the method that I use most is a chromatography method. I use column chromatography a lot, but there are also other chromatography methods. So there is HPLC, which is high performance liquid chromatography. Um, that I have also used, but I use column chromatography a lot. And of course, when I do the column chromatography, I use TLC um, to help me to see what's in there. Sorry for the technical jargon for <laughs> non-chemistry people. The plant that you chose for your study, your initial uh, flower. Mm -hmm. Did you choose that because of the wives' tales you've heard from the region, or did you know that it had properties uh, like the aloe plant for sunburn? You know that you figured out know, maybe I'll look into it, and no one else ever did that. Right. Okay. So um, no one else ever did that, and that was a big reason for choosing um, that to study as well. And we knew that the family of plants that the plant is from. Um, Clusia, Flava, and Garcinia humilis is known for a lot of useful compounds. And so we figured if, you know, 90% of them, you know, you found something good in them, then, you know, hopefully this one is in the 90 and not in the 10. So um, one reason for choosing a plant or something to study is if nobody has looked on that before from that perspective or any at all, and also, if you can, you know, help to make um, sands uh, more advanced, so, you know, add something to sands, and if you can help to make the world a better place. So, those are some of the questions that you want to ask when you're making um, decisions on what to research. Thank you. Thank you. Did you ever come across, like, uh, someone trying to artificially select plants so that maybe they can give off chemicals that cure certain uh, or something like that. Um, I don't know if I would call it artificial selection, but there are many techniques um, that people use to try and figure out quickly, would this be good? So there are assays. So again, back to our pharmacology and biology students, um, what some chemists do, and even some chemists learn these techniques, um, you take your mixtures, and you do different assays, so an assay to see if it has anti-cancer properties or antioxidant properties. And if you get you know, good results from that, then you pursue that. If you get bad results, then you don't look at it. So there are many ways in which uh, people can select um, how they pursue something and why they pursue something. And we have time for one more question, if there is one. Well, if there are no more questions, um, thank you guys very much, but I'll be available after. So if you didn't want to ask in front of everybody, then you can come and ask. Them. Thank you very Let's much. Let's thank Dr. Hawkins.